largely due to the fact that we were in the middle or towards the end of a really bad recession and people thought that having a job in computer science was a ticket to finding a job. Yeah, and a brighter new world. Yeah. Were the very clever people there, and this was McGill University, wasn't it, in, in Montreal, were the very clever people there who were predicting the internet boom? Was it just the rest of us who couldn't see what was going to happen? Oh, I think there were very few of us that <laughs> saw that coming. I mean, there are a few people that may have seen the potential and certainly science fiction writers and that kind of stuff who talked about, you know, worldwide networks and that kind of thing. But I really don't think most of us, certainly on the ground at the time, had any idea how pervasive and how central to our modern lives the internet was going to become. And of course, this was before the internet became commercialized, wasn't it? So academics and universities had a couple of lines coming into them, but you know, it wasn't anywhere close to, as you say, the all pervasive internet that we have now. Oh, nothing, nothing like that. In McGill, in 1986, we got the first internet line into Eastern Canada. Just the one, just, just one line. Just one line. It was the second line into Canada. I believe the first one preceded us by about two weeks into the University of British Columbia. It was 9,600 baud, which is something that you can't even imagine internet connections that slow. And that serviced all of Eastern Canada. We thought it was the, you know, the spiffiest thing on earth. <laughs> How much information was actually being carried into the university down that one line? Mostly email. It wasn't a whole lot. You can't really pump that much information on the line that slow. We could do it. It was technically possible to do things like remote logins and that kind of stuff. And of course, this was long before the web existed. And you decided, because a lot of people were asking you to find things for them, weren't they? You decided that you needed to find a better way to get the information out quicker. That's what started you on the search for the search engine. Well, yeah, I was responsible for finding software for the professors and the students. And uh, there were about 200 of these sites scattered mostly through the States, actually. And uh, I found myself repeatedly going back to the sites to find, try and look for software. And as you well know, trying to find something by going through one file at a time is a very laborious process. So what I did was I created a bunch of uh, automated programs, scripts, that would go out every night and uh, pick a subset of these uh, archive sites, retrieve the listings from each one, and index them. And um, my boss at the time, a guy by the name Peter Deutsch, posted on one of the internet forums that we had this database, and he got inundated by people saying, well, could you look for this piece of software for us? And uh, we finally realized that this database that we compiled, or I had compiled, was uh, valuable to other people. So we uh, provided a way for others, you know, your random person on the internet, to access this database and do the searches for themselves. Mm -hmm. I love the notion, Alan, that you sent these search tools in at night. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to all the files. Well, remember, you didn't want to be doing this during the day because, you know, you didn't want to compete with people who are doing real work. So you try to do as much as possible at 3 a.m. to minimize the impact on people. Was there a eureka moment, you know, where it all started to work and you knew you had done something really quite remarkable? There was one story that I've told, uh, which is uh, the head of the computer science department was not informed as to what the system staff was doing with his computers, providing the search engine, which we came to call Archie which, by the way, is archive without the V. It has no, it's no more imaginative than that. <laughs> and uh, You could have made up something better with hindsight there, Alan. But yeah. yeah, unfortunately, people tend to tie it to the, the cartoon, which I loathe. So I tried to dispel that myth. So we had launched Archie, and at one point, this one computer in the bowels of McGill Computer Science Department was actually utilizing half of the traffic into Eastern Canada half of all the internet traffic into Eastern Canada. And everybody from both ourselves in McGill and the people, the technicians who were running the Canadian National Network at that point, didn't want it to get shut down. You know, we knew it was a valuable service and we didn't want the powers to be to shut it down. So basically they hid <laughs> the fact from their bosses that this one service was utilizing half of the bandwidth to Eastern Canada. And we just happened never to mention it to our hierarchy until one day the head of our department went to a conference and was approached by one of his equivalents at another university 
who came up to him and warmly congratulated him for Archie and what a wonderful service it was and how he was so proud that McGill was involved in this and so on. And, and he smiled and said, thank you, you're, you're more than welcome. And of course, having no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> but happy and, to take the credit. But happy to take the credit yes. and, and being the consummate diplomat that he was. And he came back to us and basically said, uh, so what the heck's going on here? What are you guys doing? You know, and then we, the, you know, the cat was out of the bag and we, we let him know. But, you know, at that point, because it had grown so much, this was quite a source of, uh, of pride. So we didn't have to, to hide it any longer. This was actually a positive thing. And how old were you then? Uh, Archie came out in 1990. So I would have been uh, 26 or 25. Right. Yeah. You must have been chuffed with what you'd managed to achieve? Um, I guess, yeah, in some ways. Remember, from my point of view, this was just a logical progression from the stuff that I was doing before. I didn't consider this to be any great leap. You know, it's not like the clouds opened up and the, and the ray came down a la Monty Python and struck me. This was just a sort of logical progression for me. So it really has only hit me in years past, actually, I think, before I realized with the advent of other search engines that, you know, I was the first and that made it an interesting contribution to the to the whole thing. But at the time, we really were, as a group, as a community, just trying to figure out what we were going to do with this thing. What then happened to Archie? Well, with McGill's assistance, we uh, launched a company, my uh, partner and myself, called Bunyip Information Systems, which, as far as we know, was the first company in the world specifically created for internet services and uh, we commercialized it and we sold licenses to it which were taken up at the height there were probably about 40 Archie servers around the world. And why didn't all of that turn into Google? Why aren't we Archieing things now or <laughs> bunyiping things now? Because well for a number of reasons. Archie didn't address the web because it didn't exist at the time it came along a few years later. And what people seem to forget is that by the time that Google came along, it wasn't that Google was the first kid on the block. There were plenty of other web search engines. What Google did is what, and what they've been rewarded for is they really returned much higher quality results. Do you resent though the almost unimaginable amounts of money that other search engine companies now make? <laughs> no, not really. I mean, you know, would I love to be a billionaire? Of course, I'd love to be a billionaire. Who wouldn't? You know. But at the time, it wasn't a commercial environment. We weren't doing it for the money. And that sounds awfully hippie, altruistic. But at the time, it really was a sort of communal effort. We, we didn't, we weren't thinking in those terms. You've done okay for yourself, though, haven't you, Alan? I mean, it's not like, you know, you're not out on the street just looking at laptops through <laughs> shop windows, are you? <laughs> With my nose pressed up yeah, against you've the got glass. Yeah, you a couple yeah. of your own. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah I'm, I'm comfortable. Do people within the computer world recognize your achievements and your contribution to it then? I am certainly not a household name, but um, I think of a certain generation, yes. McGill University in Montreal must be thrilled with you. Surely they've put a bronze statue of you on a plate somewhere, <laughs> or at least named a computer lab well, after you. I am not aware of, uh, of anything like that. I certainly have not sat for any statue, so... There's no wing of, uh, of a computer science lab or anything named after me, as far as I know. We're going to start a campaign, Alan. Um, <laughs> here's an enormous question that I now expect you to answer in about 30 seconds. I know that you are a modest man, and you're certainly you know, incredibly self-effacing about your achievements, but there must be some times when you do just sit back and say, yeah, I did it first. I did it before everybody else did. Yeah, I guess there are times where I think, wow, you know, Google is the sort of intellectual grandchild of what I created. That having been said, it really was a matter of being first past the finish line. There was a need for something like Archie. The information was out there and we needed ways of trying to find what we we're looking for. And so from my point of view, if I hadn't gotten there first, certainly somebody very soon after would have gotten there. I am lucky. I am grateful. You don't get a chance to change the world very often. And, uh, there is a certain satisfaction of knowing that, if nothing else, I'll always be a footnote in history. And the very, very lovely and modest and humble Alan Entage, and I do think we should start a campaign to have his contribution recognised, at least get some t-shirts printed. Here's Susan with her final poem. Can't get your thrills from espadrilles. <laughs>